So, kura koutou, um, ko Andrew Militeno. I'm a, uh, a GP up in Whangarei in Carmel. Um, I'm the clinical lead of the New Zealand Healthcare Homes Collaborative. Um, I'm really excited to hear from our um, panelists tonight about how to get SMOs up and running. Um, our practice has been a healthcare home for three years and been very keen to do this, but really need a bit of a kick in the butt to um, get this up and going. Uh, for our Australian panelists, it's tikanga or a custom in New Zealand to have a karakia or a blessing before a hui or a meeting. Um, idea of a karakia that's going to increase the spiritual goodwill of our meeting tonight and increase the chance of a favourable outcome. Um, I've chosen tonight's karakia. Uh, it's pretty highly aligned if you look at the, um, uh, the English translation with the aspirations of SMAs. Um, um, it's also when on Googling it, I saw that it was a karakia used by one of my uh, local kindergartens just down the road, which I thought was pretty lovely. So um, I'll bring up the karakia. Uh, so, kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa pūnamu te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i e tātou katoa, hu e tākie. Um, certainly, it's about talking about respect for each other and binding us together, so I think it's absolutely entirely appropriate for tonight's um, uh, conversation. Um, just some housekeeping. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screens is a um, question and answer function. Um, so any of you guys that are um, participating, uh, listening, feel free to post your questions and our panelists will actually try if they can to answer some during the um, presentation. I'm going to jot down the ones that seem to be most pertinent and for the last 10 minutes I'm going to ask the panelists to um, discuss them in a little bit more detail. Um, also, um, any of you just arrived late, or if you've got anybody that um, wants to look at this webinar later on, it's going to be recorded. So um, don't worry if you come in slightly late or miss something. Um, so let's get on just with my introduction to the panelists tonight. I had to apologise to um, uh, Prof Gary Eager and John Stevens about um, editing their bios, which are quite remarkably uh, lengthy and um, impressive. So. Uh, Prof. Barry Eggers is a renowned, um, is one of the pioneers of lifestyle medicine. He's a professor at the um, Health and Human Sciences at Southern Cross University, Lismore, and an advisor of the World Health Organization on Chronic Disease Prevention. He's worked in public health, corporate, and clinical health for over four decades. He's the author of 30 books, including five textbooks, 163 reviewed articles, uh, and lots of popular media articles on health and fitness. One of the initiators of the Australian Lifestyle Medicine Association. Um, uh, John uh, Stevens is a health sociologist and associate professor at the same university, uh, registered nurse, director of a number of companies engaged in health education and research, working closely with primary health networks. Uh, John was a founding member of the Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, pioneer, uh, pioneering in the use of shared medical appointments as a method to help clinicians put evidence-based lifestyle medicine into practice. Uh, and we've got from Topo uh, Medical Centre, Glenn Davies, who, in my view, um, as part of one of the practices most respected in terms of health care homes practice in New Zealand. I admired them from afar because they seem to just get up and do things and certainly heard a lot about them running SMAs. Uh, it does require pioneers and ground bakers to get the rest of us off our butt. So thanks, Glenn, for pushing us here in New Zealand along. So at this point, um, it's over to you, uh, Gary and John. The Zoom is all yours. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh... It says I cannot share. Start uh, so sorry, I just have to get rid of mine. All yours. I'm glad it wasn't my fault. I can blame you, but. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, I'm going to probably talk for 15 minutes, then hand over to John. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, preface this under the title of Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste, because we learnt very quickly. We've been doing this for about. Uh, or eight or nine years in Australia now. We learnt the, the technique off Ed Nofsinger in the United States, and then we learnt that we had to adjust it to uh, Australian conditions and Australian um, uh, funding and so on. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a broad general overview of the different forms of, uh, of shared medical points. I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, there is a reasonable knowledge about what shared medical appointments are, but if there isn't, just in summary, it's doing a, a consultation a, as a single consultation, one-on-one -on -one with a doctor and a patient, but you've got eight or nine or 10 other patients in the room 
who are contributing to that consultation and also getting cons uh, consultations sequentially with that doctor. And it's run by a facilitator who's generally a practice nurse or another allied health professional who keeps the doctor on track so that everybody gets a fair share of the consultation. Now, the different types, just briefly, if you look at the generic version of shared medical appointments, they're medical and allied health consultation and group sessions, usually with about six to 12 patients. The, uh, the English have actually taken it to doing it with larger groups, but we uh, find that about six to 12, or around about eight is the ideal. Uh, and then the type, you've got uh, different versions. The drop-in group medical appointments can be set up anytime, let's say two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and people who need an appointment in anything can come along and sit in on this one consultation. Now we have no experience with that because we haven't done it here in Australia. We do the pro, we do um, uh, pro, uh, specific shared med uh, medical appointments. They're heterogeneous. In other words, they're in a particular topic area. And we then we have now also extended those to make them into program shared medical appointments, where there is a program written with a, a video and a, a voiceover PowerPoint that leads into the um, presentation. Uh, the it, uh, it is done. You have one session per week over four, five, six um, sessions, not weeks necessarily, because they might be two weeks apart. Then the facilitator takes over, uh, does the the consultation, does the uh, discuss, does a discussion with the patients before the doctor comes in and does individual consultations. We've expanded these to make them uh, program shared medical appointments in weight loss, in smoking. We've got restless babies. We've got doing one in diabetes now. We're looking to do a whole range of others. Anxiety and depression is another one we're very keen on because no matter what we do, whether it's weight loss, smoking, or or chronic pain, um, there's, I apologise. I think we might be at war at the moment. There's a helicopter just passing over my house here. Pardon the noise. Uh, and these, uh, these uh, program shared medical appointments are then put into a, a package, if you like, which anybody can do anywhere around the world. Mind you, they are uh, Australian and New Zealandized for this now, what happened then was we had the COVID virus hit and uh, we weren't able to get people together face to face. So we instantly changed to virtual shared medical appointments and then virtual program shared medical appointments. And uh, we'll talk about, I'll talk a bit about those before I hand over to John. Could you just excuse me while I close the door? I don't know what's going on outside. I live uh, near the beach at Manly and we have rescues all the time down on the beach. So uh, I'm assuming that must have been something like that. So uh, the four different types then, the shared medical appointments. And what I would say about all of those is if you've seen one shared medical appointment, you've just seen one shared medical appointment because they uh, can differ to the extent that you want them to differ. If one group doesn't work, then you try something else with another group. So there's no set format for these. It's just a process that uh, you adapt to your circumstances. And a straight shared medical appointment, whether it be homogeneous or heterogeneous, is an individual medical consultation uh, run sequentially in groups of participating patients. Uh, this is what it looks like. You've got here a doctor, the facilitator over here, uh, and a documenter. You don't necessarily need a documenter. The Americans use documenters because they've got more people on staff and because of their financial situation. But we have the facilitator doing the, the uh, taking of notes for the patients as each patient is consulted here. And then there's a breakout room if the doctor needs to go into there or if the facilitator is a nurse and can take the patients individually in for individual observations while the, the group keeps going um, with the, uh, the facilitator or the doctor. Uh, uh, or somebody else keeping that discussion going there. This one is done out in far western New South Wales. We were told when we did this that you couldn't do these in a country area because everybody would talk about it and uh, there would be secrets that uh, people didn't want to share. Uh, I'll say right up front that we have a, non a confidentiality agreement that everybody signs at the start to say that they won't do this. But we've found in Australia that we had no problems with this at all. 
and in America where they've had over a million of these different groups, uh, they uh, have had no trouble. And if they don't have trouble with litigation over there, then you're not likely to have it in Australia or New Zealand. So the program shared medical appointments are a sequence of shared medical appointments in a semi-structured form, providing discrete educational input relating to a specific topic. And as I say, the ones that we've done, the first one we did was weight control, which was very successful. John's going to talk about that and the results which have been published in that. We've done chronic pain, we've done uh, quitting smoking, we're doing diabetes at the moment, and uh, we've, we're looking to do a number of others, which we'll talk about towards the end. This is the sort of thing, this is another program shared medical appointment that I just didn't mention there. This is the Possums Clinic. It's for parents with uh, disturbed babies, and it's run by uh, Dr. Pam Douglas in Queensland. She did the original training with us and then went off and developed this herself. So uh, we don't do all the development, but where we do do the development of a program shared medical point, we get the experts in, get their opinions, and then get it written in a form that uh, is, uh, provides the appropriate health literacy for whatever audience that we're dealing with. In this case, Pam did that herself, and this program has a book that goes with it and other handout materials that go with it as well. So just as a program shared medical appointment, it might go over six sessions, for example, uh, once every two weeks or once a week, depending on what it is. With smoking, we do it once a week over five sessions. With weight control, we do it once every fortnight. We started off doing it uh, once a fortnight for two fortnights and then a month, a month, a month apart. And we thought that that would work better because it gave them more time to put it into action. But the patients actually preferred to have it every two weeks and we've found since, because we went back 12 months later, that it actually worked better that way every two weeks uh, anyway over the 12-month period. The next one is the, um, the virtual shared medical appointments. And this happened right on the edge of the COVID crisis. We were fortunate enough to be having to just be uh, recruiting a group to run a, a newly di developed diabetes or pre-diabetes uh, pre diabetes prevention program that we were about to run in the western suburbs of Sydney. And then the crisis hit and nobody wanted to come in for uh, a face-to-face -face consultation. So we developed these individual medical consultations run sequentially online in groups of participating patients. And I'll just give you an example of this because not only did we have trouble getting people in uh, for the face-to-face the, um, -face consultations, but initially, when it changed to virtual, we had patients getting in for the virtual consultation because all they wanted to know about was the, the virus, COVID-19. So we said, okay, let's capitalise on that and try and uh, get people ad adjusted to sh a virtual shared medical appointments by developing one on the virus. And this is a little one, I hope this plays, but this, is this was developed by Dr. Kim Seng Lim, who was the president of one of our uh, medical associations out here. Uh, and with, with us writing it. Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Seng Lim, and I'm a general practitioner and the current New South Wales president of the Australian Medical Association. I won't go, I won't go through that because he talks for about a minute, minute and a half as an introduction, and then he voices over questions and answers like this. Oops, no, gone too far. I don't think we've got the voiceover. Anyway, he's, he's doing the voiceover for a number of questions like this. And at the end of each of these uh, one page PowerPoint presentations, he stops and asks for questions. Anybody wants to elaborate on any of those questions that he's talked about there. This worked very well and it, it conditioned people to the whole idea of shared medical appointments. Uh, so the, we then uh, started to develop the virtual shared medical appointments uh, with in a program form. So uh, that is a sequence of shared medical appointments in a semi-structured form, providing discrete educational input online to a specific topic. And just to sum up, because that finishes me, because I'll show you uh, just an example here of the Possums program that was then turned quickly into a virtual online program. But it, it's, uh, shared medical appointments are basically run like we're doing this year except that the doctor and the facilitator share the, chair, the chairing of the, um, the presentation and each individual patient is given an opportunity to comment, but they can also comment on each patient's consultation. So the great advantages of shared medical appointments, the two or three main advantages, 
One is that you, uh, the, the, the patients um, are able to contribute and therefore that takes the pressure off the doctor and the facilitator. They sometimes know more because they've been through the experience than, than both the doctor and the facilitator or can add their experiences to that. So the, you get peer support from other people with the same problem there. The other advantage is, of course, that you're dealing with 10 patients within an hour, which might take two to three hours by the time you get set up and do that. So it's a very efficient. If you've got, as you have in New Zealand, and we're just trialling it here, a, um, a, per, a capitation model, then uh, it suits this ideally because it's much more efficient in the time available. Um, there are some other advantages that John might sort of want to discuss as well, but I think I'll stop there and hand over to John. And then if you've got any questions to me, uh, I can answer those on the Q&A or at the end of the session. Andrew? Thanks, Gary, that's awesome. Um, we, um, all you panel uh, participants, and, uh, um, feel free to ask any questions you like. We've got one so far, but um, the more the merrier. And um, so we'll let um, John get underway if he wants to sh uh, share a screen. Go for it, John. Thanks, folks. Hey, and thanks for the invitation to speak. It's very great. It's terrific. And um, congratulations, too, on the way you've New Zealand's handled this COVID crisis. You've really led the world in terms of how that's done. And uh, I think that deserves some acknowledgement. And I'm going to share my screen with you and carry on with talking about shared medical appointments. And in my case, I'm going to share the screen. We see my screen slides. Yep. You can Thanks. Make that. Good. Good. I was going to talk about how, how it can work in practice. As Gary said, we've been uh, trialing shared medical appointments in Australia probably now for about seven or eight years. Very slow to get going in Australia because of our medical benefits scheme. Uh, how each um, medical activity, well, probably as it was in New Zealand, uh, is paid for per item number and each, each activity has an item number that's paid for. And it was very slow for us to get going because the, the momentum was um, halted because our, our Medicare system wouldn't give us certainty on whether or not shared medical appointments could be, could be given. Um, our doctrine for this is that a shared medical appointment is a one-on-one -on -one consultation, but just happens to be in the presence of others. The same as if you were doing family consultations, etc. Uh, but it took our, our medical benefits scheme still hasn't gone that way. We know in New Zealand uh, with your capitation model that, that it lends itself more widely for uh, uptake and uh, Glenn, Glenn's been trialling this for some time. And no doubt he's got some good stories there to tell you shortly. Uh, Gary went over to uh, the UK uh, only three years ago and they, uh, it was like a wildfire. They took it, saw it and then National Health, Serv National Health System over there was ripe for it. And they've gone from zero to a thousand medical centres now that are using uh, uh, shared medical appointments in some form consistently now over there. So uh, in, in the States, it's hard to get a read on the States who's using it over there, but some of the hospitals are. And we know, for example, the Cleveland Clinic is using it, um, one of the big hospitals over there. And one of our colleagues who's helped us develop this, uh, Marianne Samago, tells us she runs about 60 to 70 individual shared medical appointments in a whole range of areas from arthritis, diabetes, mental health, et cetera, 60 of them a week in her hospital. And in fact, it's the main way the hospital now uh, makes its revenue because it's so efficient, such an efficient way to run the majority of, especially chronic disease related illness um, treatments. Um, Gary sort of explained to you shared medical appointments in, in general, and uh, you can have a shared medical appointment, just a one-off as you described, very efficient, very effective, it engages people. You'd be surprised how quickly people in a group of between eight and 12, eight and 15, depending on your circumstances, how many you bring into your group, um, how quickly they bond as a group and how, how effective a uh, shared medical appointment is in this situation. The mantra is one on, there's a, uh, it's a one on one consultation, uh, but it happens to be in a group of other patients. So it doesn't really matter how you construct that. Um, what I'm going to show you now is one way we constructed it. And it was around this idea of a program shared medical appointment, which Gary talked to you about, which is a sequence of shared medical appointments. Basically, we have the shared medical appointment process and we, we button on a, uh, a specific program in education or behavioral change. And we call that a program shared medical appointment. 
It, uh, as Gary said, we, we have actually constructed them and tested them in, in these areas, weight management, chronic pain, self-management, smoking cessation, COVID-19, unsettled babies he showed you, and uh, diabetes prevention we're trialling right at the moment. These other ones are ones we're trialling and there's, there's no end to the possibilities of the programs that you can drop into this, except they have to be designed. Lots of programs on all these topics, as you would know, a lot of them collect dust, they, they run, they're good. The, the, evidence, the evidence for them is excellent, the valuations are fine, but then the funding stops and they collect dust, they never go anywhere. The beauty of these is if you construct them so that they fit the SMA process in Australia, because the MBS will uh, fund a lot of it, and no doubt uh, the, uh, the funding mechanisms in New Zealand also pick up on this, uh, they can be sustainable. So the weight management program, that, for example, that I'm gonna show you in some detail, here uh, is, is, is no, um, there's no new gimmicks here for anybody who's done any weight management before, except it does fit this system. And, and as you'll see, it's very, very effective. <clears throat> so we combine a shared medical appointment with a weight control program in this case, and we hopefully make a ha happier life. Now, this is in a face-to-face -face scenario, what a shared medical appointment looks like. And indeed, this is a shared medical appointment in a program, shared medical appointment in weight management for men. We use a whiteboard here, which we can put up with the patient's permission, some sort of, some of the measures, their HbA1c's, their weight, their waist, things that we think are useful. And uh, as they come back, and in this particular program uh, of six sessions over 12 weeks, two weeks apart, uh, we put these results up and the patients can see how they're progressing against each other, a bit of competition for the men. Interestingly, we have a, men's program and a women's program, because we've learned by experience that uh, men and women don't like to be in the same room together doing weight management. And so uh, when it comes to doing the weight management for women, they don't like the sort of competitive stuff with their, their weights and waist up. In fact, they don't like this whiteboard at all, but the men do. Um, you can see the doctor sitting here. Now Gary will have delivered the program and I'll show you how that program is delivered in a second. And he delivers the program, manages the space, makes sure the GP is in and out within an hour. That's the decided time in this particular one. We did have a uh, documenter here and a registered nurse who could take some of these measures. That was very useful. So Gary finishes his program, goes for somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes of uh, showing a narrated PowerPoint and uh, then answering questions and, and encouraging discussion. And he thinks he's got to a po point he needs to get to in this particular session. He brings the GP in and she does a one-on-one -on -one consultation with these patients about their issues to do with weight and things that might bounce off that, that education program. She also can draw on Gary's experience as a, as a weight management expert. And uh, between them, they become a, a good team in this part of the shared medical appointment process. This particular program comes with a, a kit of readings, a participant workbooks, some samples of weight, man of weight uh, uh, of meal replacements, we give them little incentives like uh, fridge magnets to remind them what's going on in the space. Now, the main part of the program that Gary delivers is actually a narrated PowerPoint that is online that any facilitator can, can have. And it negates the, the need for the facilitator to be an absolute expert in weight management. They need some knowledge of it, but they don't have to be an expert in it. Uh, the, the, the narrated PowerPoint brings together all the evidence and the points that we want the patients to sort of gather and the activities that they need to do. Uh, it really is the job of the facilitator to make sure everyone's understanding that, uh, using their workbook efficiently and, um, and moving through the program and with the correct discussion, etc. If there's uh, health literacy issues there, again, up to the facilitator to identify that and translate information so that it's uh, literate. Uh, this is an example of the narrated PowerPoint. We have uh, one of our Dr. Colleagues here who's delivering some of this information and the patients watch this on streamed from the video on a screen. They can also then access this at home at any time. For the next few years, they can come back and review these sessions online as well. And they get all this, uh, that other kit I showed you. Now, we also, as Gary said to you, we, we've experimented with these online. You can imagine now that we can stream this, this uh, narrated PowerPoint uh, to, to a waiting room where there's people meeting face to face or we can do it virtually online. And we've experimented with this online and it's been extraordinarily successful. Facilitator still delivers the information, shows the streamed PowerPoint, uh, narrated PowerPoint for all the information. She delivers by mail the, the little kit that goes out to patients. And uh, 
when she's ready, she invites the doctor in and he has a one-on-one -on -one consultation with each of these patients about their issues to do with weight. And we, we repeat that six times over, over 12 weeks with different information obviously coming each week it, with each session with uh, the PowerPoint session. Now we trialled this and last year published it in the Australian Journal of General Practice. And we had over 220 patients in this trial of which 76% uh, were retained in it. That means we call them the completers. These are the people who did more than four of the six sessions. And we called the non-completers, those who did less than or pulled out of it, our non-completers and we used them as our comparator group. And what we found was that, the complete, that of the completers, 176 of them, 80% of them lost some weight during the program. And 36% of them lost more than 5% of their BMI and kept it off over 12 months. And we're just getting the uh, two year data in at the moment. And it looks like most of the people of the, of the completers are keeping this off. Compared to the non-completers of which uh, only 6% got 5% of their weight off and kept it for 12 months. When you look at the graphs, all right, when you look at the graphs here, you can see the red line are the non-completers, blue line are the completers, and you can just see how much more effective those are. Look, and it's not a controlled trial, it's not a random controlled trial, so we, we still have some issues and some questions to answer about, you know, why people were completing and not completing. There's a, we have some discussion points on that we can't go into here, unfortunately. Uh, they rated extraordinarily well on a Likert scale, a five-point Likert scale. They rated the program in the in the fours. And would they recommend it to others? 85% said yes, they would recommend it to others. And would they prefer this to a one-on-one -on -one consultation? Yes, they would. So they love the idea of the of the group consultation and they love the way in which the information was shared, the power of the group to encourage activities and to, to share information and help each other translate. The information was incredibly strong. We found it to be four times more cost effective than, uh, than uh, weight management programs that were found in, um, in the literature, in literature reviews, and eight times more time efficient than standard ones used in general practice. And it's also 10 times more cost effective than weight management programs, uh, commercial weight, weight management programs. So they were very powerful. Uh, and of interest, and I bring this up because I, I, I know your um, healthcare homes deals with a lot of uh, a lot of patients who might be from disadvantaged areas or might be from uh, indigenous Ma Maori groups and Pacifica groups. We found that this is an incredibly powerful tool, shared medical appointments on their own, all program shared medical appointments, incredibly powerful tool for our Aboriginal clients. And we've found the greatest success we've had with it, in fact, with our Aboriginal communities. Uh, as it turns out, they've been doing shared medical appointments for a very, very long time. We just repackaged it for them in a way that uh, it made sense from a health perspective. This is a bunch of women that were doing uh, a program shared medical appointment and weight management. They chose to do it as a gym, sitting around a uh, boxing ring of all things. And it was very effective for them. In terms of uh, data, 25 Aboriginal women were included in that program I just showed you before. 76 completed and 65% of them said they loved the approach and would prefer that to a one-on-one -on -one approach. On average, they lost about three kilos each. One woman lost uh, 22 kilos and uh, at least um, uh, five of the women lost 5% of their body weight and kept it off for 12 months. It's about 26%. These are very strong, powerful figures uh, when you compare them to what's happened in the past in the literature. Um, I can recommend them to you. They're fantastically fun to do. And Glenn will tell you about some of those experiences, I'm sure, in, in his, his spiel coming up. And there's some reference lists there, and there's a short video if you get hold of these slides uh, on that link there that shows you the weight management program in video form. And I might stop that there, Andrew. Thanks so much, John. That's awesome. And the evidence looks really quite compelling, which is um, interesting. Another thing that you've pointed out, which is um, these things when they're up and running, uh, good for business, they're cost effective, um, which is always a concern, but um, uh, in a capitated system, what you're describing is something that actually makes really good business sense. So, Glenn, when you're ready to go, you can just go for it. Keep right, the questions so, coming, uh, guys. 
Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. My name's um, Dr. Glenn Davies. I'm a, a GP in Taupo. As you would have picked up, um, Gary and um, John have uh, really demonstrated how this is supposed to be done. I'm really doing the bloopers reel. I'm, I'm going to show you um, how not to do it. If, if any of you have heard me talk about shared medical appointments, I've um, kind of emphasised uh, all the mistakes that we've made. Um, and the same thing happened uh, with starting virtual shared medical appointments. So hopefully um, you find this uh, entertaining. Um, some of it I found mortifying, but um, uh, here we go. So first of all, um, I'll try and share my screen. Um, Um, okay, so um, so um, as part of what I do in Topo, I run um, with uh, uh, Sarah Hancock and others a group called Reverse Type 2 Diabetes Topo. Um, up until COVID, we were running um, group, uh, we were running sessions uh, where we would have between 10 and 120 people would um, turn up on a Wednesday night. And we're basically talking about how to reverse your type two uh, diabetes. And then of course COVID um, hit and we were no longer able to um, meet in groups. So we went, um, okay, let's have a go at, um, at virtual um, shared medical appointments. Um, and this is kind of um, our story. And we really had the attitude um, um, have a go, mate. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? And um, I'm really going to talk about um, what did go wrong. But we had a whole lot of fun as well. Resume uh, slideshow. Okay, so what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Okay, so this was the first one that we ran. This was. Um, we called this uh, New Zealand's first virtual shared medical appointment, um, probably. Uh, that was because we didn't know if anyone else in New Zealand uh, was doing them. But we were marketing this on um, Facebook, so um, it needed a bit of uh, a bit of a vomp to uh, get people to um, get excited about it. So um, we called it uh, New Zealand's first virtual shared medical appointment. Um, and what was really cool about this is that we had people from all over the country. So um, so Phil was from Taupo, um, lady from Palmerston South, just uh, north of Dunedin in the South Island. Uh, the next lady was from Fongaray. Uh, Jala was from Hamilton. Um, I've forgotten where um, one of the gentlemen was from. Uh, the man on the side there was from Tauranga. Um, I was a facilitator. Uh, Sarah was the expert and the other um, uh, from Taupo. So um, what could possibly go wrong? Well. Um, I was a bit stingy and I didn't buy the upgraded um, version of Zoom. So at 40 minutes, um, the Zoom link uh, fell out and, and it all stopped. Um, but what was even worse was um, I was, we were putting it onto Facebook Live as well because on our Facebook group, there's about 2,160 members. And so each um, Facebook Live is um, viewed by around 300 people. So it was also on Facebook Live, but I didn't know how to do that you know, like um, on the computer, like you guys are doing now. So I was just um, filming it on my phone. Um, but what I didn't realize was when I was trying to buy the upgraded version of Zoom so we could carry on, all my credit card details were still um, were being shown on the, um, on the uh, video link to all 300 people that were. So that was, that was my um, learning experience for that, is turn off the Facebook uh, Live when you're putting your credit card details uh, onto a screen but it was really cool it, um, it worked really well and fantastic to have people from all around the country and that that um, Gary was talking about how probably the best teachers are somebody who's had the same experience and in this group here we had some wonderful interaction between the people sharing their experiences and their advice um, the next one um, we call this virtually New Zealand's first virtual shared medical appointment. Um, and uh, that all went um, fairly well. Um, and um, Anjala, who is in the left 
top corner there. She, um, after attending as a member on the first one, she um, did the uh, Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine um, facilitator training in, um, in shared medical appointment, and she actually facilitated this one. So this was the first one that she facilitated. Um, Sarah and I were the experts, and, um, and that kind of went quite well. Apart from this, um, this was being, it was being um, screened again on Facebook Live, but you know the chat um, function on Zoom, you can um, put a chat to the whole group or a chat to somebody privately. So the, the private chats that were coming just to me, were just coming to me on the Zoom screen, but on the uh, computer screen that was uh, going up Facebook Live, all of the um, confidential ones were going out to the whole group. So again, that was a, a little bit of a fail, but again, it was a good session. Um, why aren't I getting my next slide to... Um, Um, I'm just going to stop the screen share for a second and come back in because because um, that's uh, locked itself. So sorry. I'll just um, do the screen share again. All right, and then. Um, we went, okay, we're breaking new ground here. How about doing New Zealand's first virtual program shared medical appointment? So, um, so I did this on um, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia in uh, the genesis of type 2 diabetes. And that all worked well, apart from the fact that um, my um, screen share didn't work. So everyone on the Facebook Live was seeing it, but the people um, in the Zoom meeting uh, didn't. So I don't know if you've ever tried to explain complex biochemistry without um, access to slides. Um, very, very difficult. So, so that was the fail that went on there. And then this is probably my biggest fail is um, I then bought a new phone and um, when I set up the Facebook Live on this one, um, the phone had to be this way up to, um, to start the Facebook Live. But then my um, camera holder only held, holds the phone on its side. So when I tipped it onto its side, it um, continued um, in that format. So everybody was watching the screen like, <laughs> like, like that. So, um, um, and I still haven't worked out how to make that work properly. Maybe someone who's a little bit more IT savvy than me can do that. But when we actually got back into our venue and started having our face-to-face -face meetings again, the people said they were so used to watching me um, sideways, they asked if I would um, turn the, um, the whiteboard around because they preferred lying on the couch on their side uh, watching. So there we go. And then the final um, one, the final virtual program shared medical appointment we did was on health coaching and, um, and Jala, um, was uh, I facilitated that and uh, Jala and Sarah were the experts and that was an excellent session and if we've got time we've got a little bit of um, video from that um, that you might like to look at if Scott's um, still there. So um, so what did we learn? Um, I've just got a wee little anecdote to um, tell about what did we learn. My my brother-in-law, Tony, um, is a psychiatric nurse and he was working in a forensic uh, unit and uh, one of his well-known clients had just had all of his front teeth knocked out by a police baton. And Tony said to him, um, you know, what did you learn from this experience? Expecting him to say something like, don't try and escape from the police. And he said, um, what I learned from this experience is now that I can't eat apples. So. The, the point of that story is what you learn is not necessarily what you expect to learn. So the first thing that we learned is don't put Glenn in charge of any of the technology because um, uh, it's probably not going to go all that well. And it didn't. But the reason perhaps I'm sharing all this bloopers with you is, um, you know, like stuff goes wrong, but the entire experience, despite the technological challenges, perhaps despite the mistakes I made, it was an excellent session. Um, all of those sessions were fantastic. I think everyone enjoyed them. And in some ways, showing your vulnerability, showing that you make mistakes like everyone else does, 
um, I think kind of leads to it and didn't distract too much, I hope. The second thing that we learned is that chief medical appointments are awesome, but there's a number of barriers and challenges um, to organizing a shared medical appointment, um, a standard face-to-face -face shared medical appointment. And the first one is promotion. It takes quite a lot of effort to get um, your group of six to 12 people along to a shared medical appointment. Um, what we found with this was it was incredibly easy. We have, um, so 2,166 members on the Facebook page. All it took was one post saying, hey, we're doing New Zealand's very first shared medical appointment and do you want to be part of history? And that was the entirety of the promotion and the people were there. So, so promotion was easy. The second challenge um, with your face-to-face -face shared medical appointment is getting um, a number of people, 12 to, you know, six to 12 people together in a room at one time. You know, there's challenges around childcare, there's challenges around getting away from work. Um, and what we found with, um, the virtual shared medical appointment is people were in their own home, uh, they were locked down in, anyway, um, but it was easy to get them there, they didn't have to organise childcare, they could even cook dinner uh, while they were taking part on their phone. So, so I think the virtual shared medical appointment actually has significant advantages over the original shared medical appointment. And then the, the virtual programme shared medical appointment has, has extra advantages. So the virtual shared medical appointment was easy to promote using Facebook. Um, we had people from all around the country and it doesn't just have to be around the country, of course it um, can be all around the world. And another thing is I actually found it easier to facilitate. Um, those of you that have experienced um, facilitating a face-to-face -face shared medical appointment will realize one of the challenges stopping people talking over each other what I find on, um, on the Zoom environment is people are less likely to do that. And of course, you've always got the option of, mute, of muting them, which, which you don't have um, in the face-to-face -face environment. Um, the chat function was really good for questions. Um, uh, Gary demonstrated how, um, or sorry, John demonstrated how Gary was using the whiteboard um, in that weight management um, uh, face to face shared medical appointment. We just used the chat function um, for people to put their questions up, and I found that worked um, really well. Um, what are the challenges in a virtual shared medical appointment? Well, of course, the challenges are the technology. I'm, um, I'm showing you all the challenges that, that I had through not being a tech whiz, but um, we had a go and they worked. And then the um, the program virtual shared medical appointment, I think the um, screen share um, option is, um, is really, really good um, uh, when, when it works. So um, I think that's the end of my um, talk, but um, there is the option of watching a little bit of some of that video from the, the virtual program shared medical appointment on, um, on health coaching if, um, if that's an option and Scott can play it. Anne-Marie, did you...? Um... Yeah, I want to raise something that I, I'm kind of acutely aware of. Um, like, so we started this journey in July last year with the goal of reversing my husband's diabetes and me getting some weight off. And we did really well for nine months. And we've had a few people see what we've done and they've taken up the philosophy and they've changed their diets as well. And but after a while, I feel a lot of people start going in competition with us. You know, it's a race to how low you can get your weight. And um, I actually find it extremely demotivating. So I've done my best to kind of show people that this is a great way of eating and living. And yes, it's been really successful for it. But yeah, I, you reach a point where all of a sudden everyone else becomes the expert. And it's actually demotivating me now. So I was just wondering if you've ever seen that kind of thing before or if you can help me work through this because it's very I'm having trouble getting started again because so um, that, that's it for me uh, Andrew back over to you yeah thanks so much Ben um, I guess what you're doing in some ways um, with you know opening up to a whole uh, wider audience is one thing I guess the um, I'd quite like to ask you um, 
if you're intentional, what you're currently doing is to just uh, have it in-house in terms of the patients that you've got as your own patients in your practice in tow for who you're trying to manage with various conditions? Is that uh, uh, in the pipeline or are you also doing that type of work? So this, this was with our community group called Reverse Type 2 Diabetes Type 4. So this was um, outside of the medical centre. Um, we haven't um, got the virtual shared medical appointment program going inside the, um, the, the medical centre. So it was really just COVID. Um, we were running these groups anyway, and COVID just created the, the opportunity to, to yeah. move into this virtual environment. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, we've got a few questions uh, for all you guys, so I'm just going to fire a few off. I'm actually interested um, with Gary and John whether um, what you're describing, is that more um, dealing with a practice population that have been um, sort of targeted and invited in terms of attending the um, SMOs? Yeah, so the majority of the ways in which our patients get involved in a shared medical appointment is through recruitment through the well, for the staff at the medical center. We found that if the GP actually recruits, asks someone to come along, two things happen. They, they get to visualize, they get to choose who's coming to the group to make sure they fit the group and uh, aren't someone who's gonna destroy a group. Um, and they, and they, their reasons for coming are, 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 can be better assessed, if you like. So the success yeah. in the group is good. Uh, we also found that, you know, if, a, if the doctor actually asks someone along to an SMA, we get about an 80% uptake. And we found that if the, if the practice nurse asks, we got about a 50% uptake. And if it was recruitment done at the front desk, it was about a 25% uptake. So, and if you send out letters, it was about 10% uptake. Yeah. So uh, the GP is in the, in the driving seat to, to recruit people. Yeah. Um, and, and we had a question too about sort of confidentiality and consent in terms of obviously some things you might discuss are reasonably uh, personal and um, how that's dealt with. We generally try to, sorry, Gary, you, but we generally, we generally try to um, keep things within certain limits within each shared medical appointment. So if it's a shared medical appointment about diabetes and they suddenly want to talk about their breast cancer or show you a lump under their arm, etc., the facilitator would take that moment to say, look, very, very important, don't have that resource or capacity within the shared medical appointment. Let's make another appointment for you straight away after this and we'll deal with that. So th there's ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Also, if you have the, the physical resource, you could for a moment have a breakout where the, the doctor and the patient went to the breakout room and the facilitator kept the chat going while that was, while that was happening. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Now, we, um, one of my colleagues in Northland is um, uh, asking how you guys are thinking about using it for you know, remote and rural populations. Certainly in Northland, we've got a real tyranny of distance and geography and uh, poor riding, poor uh, vehicles, and uh, this virtualization of SMAs would be ideally suited to uh, rural and remote communities. So, have you guys been doing any of that in terms of the challenges or how that might be addressed? Gary, unmute yourself. You might want to answer this one. I thought nobody was listening to me. Um, so, so I, I can answer that. Like I just just add to what was John was saying for the last uh, from the last question too. We, we've found you know when you get people in groups, at least after the first group, the first group's a bit of an ice icebreaker. But when when they come back after that, they share the incredible intimate details of what goes on, and we've got several examples of that happening. And in fact, if you listen to people in a waiting room, they're quite intimate about what they talk about to other patients. And once they know that they can trust the other patients, they do sign a confidentiality agreement to say that they're not going to talk about this out, outside. Uh, it's, it's, that's not really an issue. On the, on the second question, you know, we, we've got a much uh, wider country than you have and a much more difficult area to yeah. reach than most of the places in, in New Zealand. And um, we're, we've just been, we're working at the moment with one, the Royal Flying Doctors Service to uh, maybe develop this the shared medical appointments approach with them out in the west, um, we've done them where John, for example, has done one in weight control when he was at a conference in America and he was doing it with patients here in Australia. So the the remoteness is not an issue. The only issue is Glenn's issue. That's the the tech savviness of the the patient at the other end. Yeah.
thanks for that. I, um, I sounded like your own Aboriginal Indigenous population had actually taken to this, and some had actually asked, obviously, the Māori patients in New Zealand are likely to like this, and I'll be interested to um, whether anyone's got any comments. I mean, um, in terms uh, of people attending um, in uh, consultation, is it something that you think lends itself well to um, that uh, a po a, the population, like Māori population? Do we think that would be the case? You, you would have to try that, because um, there's a big difference between Indigenous Australians and Māori's, as, as you know. Yeah. But Indigenous Australian, particularly Australian men, have done this for 60,000 years. They've sat around in groups under trees and talked about yeah, yeah. problems. And, and it's just a natural thing to do. They feel very, very comfortable doing that. Uh, whereas they feel uncomfortable locked in a room with a single uh, white doctor. Yeah, I think you might be right, Gary. This, uh, up in Kaitaia, they had run a uh, uh, shared medical appointment with 17 uh, patients and it was a diabetes annual review. They had the retinal screening people, podiatry, everyone all at once. and. All 17 said they'd never come back to a face-to-face -face single consultation. And that was a, they were all Māori patients. They just, it was collaboration, it was whānau, it was their, the, the being together and sharing of the yeah. uh, of, of a problem. So not, they all said, I'm never coming back to see the doctor on my own. I'm coming back to do this collaboration. I, I, would, I would suspect that that's going to be the case for most First Nation people all around the world. But I don't know. We haven't had the experience of that. So I'd be keen to hear from other people. Someone had um, asked to, about the program to um, share medical appointments and, um, you know, one of the things we do in New Zealand, we're obliged to do in most areas, is do a diabetes annual review. Um, and that's a sort of a program and I would have thought having that as part of what you do inside a shared medical appointment would be fairly um, useful, but I think they could only be done by face-to-face -face rather than virtually because you have to take some, um, you know, do foot checks and, and the like. John and, and Gary, you doing that? Is that part of almost what you're doing? And someone using a very structured program around a certain type of condition that you're trying to manage? We we haven't yet done it uh, where you need the uh, the you know the individual consultations. The diabetes review. I just answered one of the questions there earlier, which I think would be an ideal uh, thing to do. But I'm just not sure about uh, the the individual aspects of the consultation. You might have to have an individual consultation as well. We, we know a, a lot of our GPs use the opportunity, when, when they become comfortable with the SMA, they use that opportunity to, to understand that they haven't done their foot checks, they haven't done their reviews, they haven't done, you know, it's a really yeah. great chance to pick up on all the care that they, they need to catch up on, uh, you know. Andrew, well. could, could I just go back to, um, to your previous question? I, I think a Mirai, is a fantastic place to think about organising a face-to-face um, -face shared medical appointment. Um, and my comment would be that um, that I think Māori feel far more comfortable if um, the whole whānau is there. Yeah. And, um, and the ones that I've done with um, three generations from the same family have just been hilarious. You know, it was a Friday afternoon and the banter was... was Far more fun than um, going down to a bar with my friends because um, the the banter between the aunties and the grandparents and the uh, and the mukapuna is uh, is just hilarious. So um, so yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, I'd imagine. And um, Norma from up in uh, Kaitaia has just confirmed that they just find it uh, very powerful up up far north. And um, the other thing someone had mentioned is you know uh, would people be willing to pay for this process? But if you think about a normal 15 minute consultation, that's all the value you get. Um, you're getting four times the value time-wise if you go to an hour long consultation. And not only that, you hear a whole lot more content and you've also got the content of each other. So I would very much doubt that someone would be unhappy to pay for that level of service if it was the same price. So you're getting four, you know, much more than four times the value probably. So Andrew, are you, are you suggesting that you charge four times the cost <laughs> yeah, no, if it goes really well, way more than that, depending on, you know, it really is going to go up to 10, I'd imagine. Uh, You're going to have to hire it for your tech skill, but... But I think it's the same, I don't think it would, um, it would interest, I don't think you, people would object to paying for it. I think it's a much superior experience they're getting. Um, uh, it might not be in some of the programs that they're charge programs, like, uh, you know, um, Care Plus type of programs, but that shouldn't be a barrier. I would have thought you really felt that was valuable for you. Um, Someone was uh, quite rightly in um, 
typical healthcare homes type of uh, um, cheating, asking how we can actually share some of the um, the content of these programs you guys are running and not have to reinvent the wheel? Because you guys obviously show some sort of videos and stuff before you start. Um, is that all IP that you have to buy off your um, lifestyle uh, associations or um, how would that work? We're just uh, uh, negotiating that at the moment with the PHNs that we that we work with. They, they actually uh, have provided the funding for the development of these and we've suggested to them that if other PHNs either here or uh, and or in New Zealand want to uh, to get the license off them, they can do it through through them. Um, and I've I've just posted an answer to one question there uh, in typical fashion. I said if you want to know more about it, just contact John, not me. Pass, pass it nice. on. Nice. Thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, look, the answer is yes. We, I'm sure we could work that out. Uh, there there is there is some maintenance costs and whatever to keep in the system running, but you know it it's not a big deal. Just that's what our collaborative is about. We're very keen on, I think it's that we probably will um, create content that will be shared back. Um, the success of the collaborative has been exactly that, is that we've been very free with what we've done so that we can all move forward. Uh, um, quite often people have already got the value out of what they've created. And so the lending on is not either competitive or actually uh, you know, a negative experience. Our, our, our vision is to actually have a, a bank of these uh, programs, yeah. programs, shared matter of points. Uh, and there's, there is a whole range of chronic diseases that you can do this in. We're very interested in doing something in uh, irritable bowel at the moment. We're looking at anxiety and depression. Uh, there's osteoarthritis, a whole range of uh, things. And we can't do them all. So if others yeah. can do them and we link in together and help each other, then and we just have a bank that we can offer it from, then uh, you know, all the better, as far as we're concerned. Have you guys finding that your patients that have attended these, obviously they liked coming back and they probably get quite a lot of um, feedback from each other. Are they starting to network a bit outside of the SMAs, like going for walks together and all that sort of stuff? Can you tell yeah, me that, about that? That, uh, that slide I showed you with the men sitting around, that was on a Sunday uh, where those men met and for over six sessions, they got to know each other quite well. One, one of them who was directly in the frame was an agoraphobic who couldn't go out walking and he said, look, I, I want to do more movement as part of it, but I can't get out, out of the door. And the, guy literally sitting next to him on that slide organized to pick him up on a Sunday and take him for a walk every Sunday. So, you know, that, that sort of um, interaction happens a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you, I think um, this is the opportunity to add some more technology in because I think that's where you start linking people together um, on, on social media. So creating a Facebook group within the shared medical appointment group that can continue after the, the program finishes is, is really clever. So there's two, two things we're doing in that space, Glenn, thank you. One is we've trained in Australia probably 600 plus facilitators to just to do the SMA piece. So we generally, people get the training to do the generic part of the SMA. And then there's a little bit extra training if you want to do a program on top of that. And so, uh, Aslam has just started a, a, a networking page for facilitators so that they can talk with each other about what they're doing and improving their skills, showing each other you know, tips and things that went wrong. I would love your film. I would love your presentation, Glenn, about the bloopers. Um, and uh, we imagine that we're, we're trying to encourage them then to do something similar for, uh, for patients as well. It's awesome. They would, um, uh, I think just about out of time, it's been so fantastic listening to you guys. It's got us motivated, I'm, all, I'm sure. I like the fact, Glenn, that you can um, have a crack and if it might all fall over, then it's um, not the end of the world, <laughs> you know, got to give it a go. Um, and it does lend itself, I think, far more um, uh, practically doing this virtually if you can, because um, it's sometimes you can sit on your own couch rather than having to drag everyone in. So. I'm almost guaranteed we're um, interested to have a go up this all around the country. Um, hey, hey, Andrew, you got you just got a second for me to share one one of my favourite uh, tech failures. Yeah, you go for it. You can you can end the end the discussion. That's the great way to do it. So thanks. So uh, so a man um, rang me up and he said his son's got a, a horrible rash, and I said, well, well, send me a photo. So um, so he sent me the photo and. Um, and it was, there was like this dark background and then there was this kind of branching floral type 
type rash and and I was going I had never seen anything like that before so I um, I changed it into the full screen PDF and um, then I saw that the arm was resting on a cushion and I was actually um, looking at the cushion rather than the, the, the rash and the, it was a it was a floral a floral pattern on the cushion so oh so, here we go just to, just to finish off on at least, at least, you, didn't, at least you didn't make some erudite diagnosis <laughs> I've seen I've seen that before that rash. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> thanks so much, guys. Um, I, I'd appreciate if the panelists just stay on for a little bit after everyone's left. Um, yeah. This um, presentation has been recorded and will be on uh, Healthcare Homes uh, Facebook, um, so it will be available. So any of you guys that have been on that uh, want to um, talk to your colleagues and want to watch it, then uh, encourage them to do so. The other thing is that the um, collaborative has got a um, uh, resource on the, on the uh, seven and find it for you. You guys might want to write this down, which actually allows you to um, not work out how to set up a um, um, seven find it here. Oh, sorry here. This one here. See this um, that username and password that can be used on the collaborative's website to. Um, look at how you can set them up in terms of uh, at least ones in person uh, but it also talks a little bit about consenting invitation uh, even some financial modeling and it's a pretty end-to-end -end process but i think that what you guys have also said you can make this much more organic and fluid than that by just giving it a go and going with it so i'd like to thank you guys so much for what you've done this evening and i'm, I'm certainly motivated so Kira, thank you very much thank you thank you cheerio, cheerio. Thanks all you participants.